Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me today. In this video, I want to talk about the books I read for the Asian Readathon. So I participated in the Asian Readathon, which, uh, which happened throughout May, and I tried to read as many books by Asian authors as possible. I managed to read five. So I'm going to start with the one I picked up first, and that was Kim Ji Yong, born 1982 by Cho Nam Yo. I picked this up because one, this was raved about by absolutely everyone who has read it on booktube, and two, because I read that this book sparked like a feminist revolution in South Korea. And I really like books with uh, the theme of feminism, and I read a lot um, in the past few years, and I haven't read anything from South Korea on this team, so I was really interested to know what is happening there and about women, I guess. This book it follows our main protagonist, Kim ji Young throughout her life. We start at the beginning when she's a mother and she kind of starts behaving weirdly, so she goes to the psychiatrist. And this book is basically the account of the psychiatrist of what he finds out about Kim ji Young. So it's uh, divided in different sections. We start from early childhood to adolescence, early adulthood, and then when she becomes a mother. And throughout this recounting of her life, we find out all of the instances in which she was discriminated against because of her gender. And we find out how truly misogynistic and gender discriminatory the Korean society is. Because Kim ji Young is basically, I guess, I mean, she's taught to really be really submissive, to put all the men in her life and men in general first, be that her father, be that her little brother, be that her husband, be that her own child. Men just come first and that's the way things always were. I mean, her grandmother also obviously prefers her little brother and her little brother gets the best choices of food and the best room and he can have a whole room to himself where she has to share. And it's just the way it is. And I guess things just get to her and she starts acting weirdly when she becomes a mother. And the way I really found this interesting is because this is basically the psychiatrist's account of her life and it is written in such a matter of fact way that it almost reads like a report. It almost reads like nonfiction. And there are a lot of uh, statistics interspersed throughout this book, so that gives it even more like a non-fiction-y feel. And yeah, I just really loved the way everything was put, like how when she was a young, like I think she was in school, she went home and someone followed her, a boy from school. And then her father actually told her that it's her own fault that she was followed, basically. So at every single stage of her life, she is defined by her gender. And it's just, it's just very interesting to read about. And I didn't know that society in, in South Korea is, is so, so gender biased. So if you haven't picked this up yet, please, please do so. It is an amazing, amazing book and I can only recommend it. The next one was the one I actually listened to, and that was Earthlings by Sayaka Murata. I have read Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata, I think, last year, and I absolutely loved it. So I knew that I'm going to pick this up. And, oh my god, this was such a ride. I mean, Convenience Store Woman is also weird in a way, but if that one is weird and the level is here. This one just goes through the roof. <laughs> this, this was the turns it took, especially towards the end, was absolutely mind blowing. I never expected it. So basically in both um, Convenience Store Woman and in Earthlings, the common theme is that of 
I guess a woman in both cases, um, of a woman who is different. So this theme of otherness. And both of these women in these books, they want to be a part of society, but they're just so different that they can't. And this is about, both of these books actually are about how society relates to them and how they relate to society and I guess the clashes that follow. So in uh, Earthings, we follow this young girl and then later when she becomes a woman and she, as a young girl, I guess you get to know her family life and her family, her extended family as well. She lives in the big city, she goes to school and then she goes to the mountains to visit her grandparents where she has a really good friend and cousin and they kind of have a similar mindset and a similar approach to things. And she views this trips to the mountain, I think, I think they happen yearly as, as, a, as a point of escape, as a point of going back to meet that person whom she feels really familiar with because everything else is just alien. And basically she conjures this alternate reality. She has a really vivid imagination in which she says that she, she, is, she is an alien basically and she came to live among earthlings so she really wants to assimilate and she really looks at these earthlings in a very like objective way and tries to analyze them and rationalize their behavior and understand them so in order so she could behave in the same way so she could assimilate. And then when she's adult, she lives in this marriage and it's a really particular marriage as well. And I really don't want to go into details, even though you can read the premise. But I think the best way to read this is not knowing. So basically she goes into this marriage because that is also part of the earthling way uh, of being, of being accepted. You have to form a family unit, the way she calls it. And you have to make babies for the factory, for society. I really love her way of coping, I guess, with the things that happened to her, with the things that are still happening to her, with how she tries really to conform. And it is so hard. And yet, at the same time, the approach is so clinical, I would say, matter of fact, that you just, I just, I just could not, I just could not stop listening. And as I said, towards the end, it really went out <laughs> bananas, I would almost say. So maybe, maybe towards the end, I thought that this was a bit too much. But I really love the commentary on society, on how, I guess, in Japanese society, you have to conform and you have to be one of the units, like a piece of Lego or a puzzle. You have to fit in. Otherwise, otherwise there's no place for you. And the coping mechanisms this girl, this girl found when she was really a small child and took with her to, to, through adulthood, it was just so, so heartbreaking at the same time. You can really be anxious for her because you feel, you feel for her and you really want her to, I guess, find her way, even though knowing that she as an alien will never fit in. She can just pretend. So if you haven't read this, please do so. If you have, please let me know what you thought about it. And especially the ending, I guess, I don't know what to think about that, but I can only, only highly recommend it. And I will definitely read everything uh, Sayaka Murata writes. The next book I read was Women Without Men by Sarnush Parsipur. I picked this up after quite randomly, like a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, I bought uh, the author's other book, Tuba and the Meaning of Night. I've never heard of this author nor that book before, but when I looked into the author a little bit more, I found this book. And I found out that when this book came out in 1989, it was banned in Iran and the author was jailed. The author now lives in exile and this book is still banned there. And it is banned because this novel depicts the lives of five women in Iran and it writes about their sexuality. This is a commentary on women and women's issues and feminism in, uh, in Iran and I guess on how constrained and how 
unequal their society is when it comes to women. So basically, these five women are really different and their lives intertwine at some point. And I love the phrase written, it's, uh, written somewhere about this. It's like, their goal, they go and live in a house separately and it's almost like a feminine utopia. But ultimately, this feminine utopia cannot really happen because women cannot really live without men at, at the end. And that's not the point of this either. So this is written in the style of magical realism. And again, looking at what people, um, how people review it and what people's thoughts are about this, I think a lot of people were disappointed by the fact that there are strong magical realism elements in this book. But I think... I guess because they expected something else, but this is not meant to be a sprawling novel about the lives of these women in detail. This is meant to be just as short and beautiful as it is, and it is meant to showcase their lives throughout these beautiful, magical um, elements. So basically, just to give you an example, one of these women is a school teacher. She says no to going out on a date with her boss, I guess, um, at school, and then she's fired. She decides to stop speaking and she decides to go and plant herself in the earth and she becomes a tree. Not all of these women are meant to be likable characters and they're not. We have, for example, apart from the school teacher, we have an older woman, an older wealthy woman who becomes a widow. We have a prostitute and we have two friends. And especially one of the friends is really like... It's really like an unlikable character. She, she really does bad things and she really brings other women down. And I think it's, it's, it's great that she was added to the story because I guess women are not the same. And even though we are supposed to uplift each other, I guess we are also different and have different views on things and different wants and needs in life. And this woman, she really goes after what she wants and she wants this man and she's going to have him no matter what. <laughs> so at the end, yes, some of these women um, end up being alone, but for the most part, they end up having men in their lives. It is a beautiful story, even though I don't gel so well with magical realism at, at all points, I found this really beautiful. And, and it, I think it did a great thing in the short amount of pages, like hundred something pages it did. So I can't wait to read the author's other book, I think, that has also strong feminist themes um, in it. The next book I read was Dreaming of Baghdad by Haifa Zangana. I picked this up because of the Invisible Cities project, in which you're supposed to read books from three different countries each month, and Iraq was at some point one of the countries. Now, it was quite hard for me to find this book because I wanted to read books by Iraqi women, and I don't know why, I just, I just couldn't find as many. And all the Google searches gave me just lists of books by men, mostly non-Iraqi men who, I guess, wrote about their experiences in Iraq or like the history of Iraq and so on and so forth. Now, I have to admit, I haven't spent hours on Google, but I did, I did try. I did try. So I'm happy I found this one. And I don't think there are a lot of memoirs like this out there and especially from Iraq. I really wanted some to read a book by a woman, someone who, who is from that country and living in that country. So even though the author is currently not living there, this is a book about her life as an activist and as a poser of the Saddam Hussein regime. It's set in the 70s, 80s, and this book um, follows her life and what happened to her while she was part of the opposition and when she was captured and jailed. So now she is living in London, or at the time of, I guess, publishing this, she was living there. And this book goes a bit back and forth, or at least it gives you sequences of life in Iraq and the political situation. It is kind of hard to piece together as it's not a very linear narrative. The writing style is also a mesh of different things. There's like letters written, there's also written in first person and third person. So it's really a combination of 
different things. And the author herself writes at the beginning that this is something that she wrote, I guess, in like 80 years. And it's just compiled together in this nonfiction narrative of her experiences. It's not a straightforward nonfiction uh, memoir type of book because it, it, it's more like a memory book and it's more like, I guess, a fractured memory of like, how do you remember things? Do you remember them correctly? It is also a heartbreaking book because she was jailed and she was tortured and she was raped while in prison. And it really tells of her life, of her parents, of her family, and what happened in the prison. She was basically, she was put into prison first, and then she was moved into different prisons. She ended up in a prostitute prison because she was forced to sign this document in which she stated that the only reason she joined the opposition was because I guess she was a libertine. At some point, it was also hard for me to follow and just put the pieces together because it was just so fragmented. So at the end, the afterward was really, I found it really um, helpful because it really, I guess, filled the holes and it really gave a better overview over and a timeline over what happened in that period and what happened to the author. It also has instances of, of course, her life in London of how alienated she is, but throughout the letters from different people also living abroad, you also get a sense of how people live in exile, how Iraqi people live in exile and how they all yearn to go back to their country and how it was. So I will definitely check out this publisher. It is published by the Feminist Press and actually it's the same publisher as uh, Women Without Men. So I will definitely need to check out more of, of, of this publisher's books because I seem to really enjoy them. And the last one I read, and I think one of the most difficult ones I read uh, in quite a while, is Burn Sugar by Avni Doshi. This was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. It was longlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction. So I, I had to check it out. It is quite a hard read and looking through the Goodreads reviews, I see a lot of two stars, I see a lot of DNFs. It is a hard one to read. It is the story of the relationship between a mother and a daughter. And the book starts, I mean, quite a hard start. It says, I would be lying if I said my mother's misery has never given me pleasure. It says in the back, sometimes I refer to Ma in the past tense, even though she's still alive. I am grieving, but it's too early to burn the body. The writing style sometimes annoyed me. I am not saying that I hated this book, I didn't, but it's it's not one you finish and you end up absolutely loving. But it is one that will that you will remember, I guess. The author I think she she wrote this throughout eight years and it was revised and revised and revised again. And for a debut is quite a good one. I will definitely check um, check the author's books out, uh, I mean future books out. But looking at this one, it is uh, about this mother who decides to leave her husband together with her small daughter and go to live in an ashram where she falls in love with this guru and becomes her concubine, I guess, for some years. And in that ashram, she really, really neglects her daughter and her daughter really has a really hard time there. And we don't really know exactly, I mean, we do know what happened, but it's not really told so specifically because this is the recount. This book is a recounting of, of their lives and it is, it is told by the daughter. When she's older, she's married. So she go, so the narrative goes back and, for, back and forth between the past and the present. And it really depicts a picture of neglect and abuse, both physical and mental, and how hard it was to grow up with this woman. It's really a love-hate relationship, and you can really 
it's really there written in the page. I mean, you, there's no escaping it. It's, it's, it's just, there's nothing between the lines. I mean, there is, but it's really obvious. The way this relationship is depicted, in a way, you kind of understand where this daughter is coming from and why all the resentment against her mother. But at the same time, it is her mother and, and she loves her. And now in the present, the, mo the mother is getting sick. She's getting Alzheimer's. So she's forgetting things. And unwillingly, the daughter has to take care of her, even though she doesn't want to. Because she says that it's so convenient for my mother now that she's forgetting things. I'm still keeping a tally of all the wrongs she did against me. But how can I keep a tally against someone who forgot what she's done? So it's almost like the mother swipes the slate clean. So there's, there's no one to fight anymore. And she, she, she really wanted that fight because I guess that's what kept her going. And at the same time, we have the relationship with her husband. The, this no, novel is set in India and her husband is um, Indian, but he grew up in, in America. So he just has a different view on life and situations and really is not helpful. He's really very, I guess, passive when it comes to helping her or giving her advice and so on and so forth. And then um, the main character gets pregnant and she has a daughter and it also deals with postpartum depression and how she navigates through that, I guess. So let me know if you have read this book and what you thought about it. It's definitely one, a hard one to like, but I think for a debut, this was absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. And um, yeah. Please, please check it out if you haven't done so yet. So these are all the books I have read for Asian Readathon. And really looking at all these books, I can't stop but realize that all of these books were about women, by women. So I think I did a great job with this Readathon and also with uh, focusing on maybe more feminist books books focused on women and women's issues and w focused on women authors from different countries. I think that was my main point and that's my main point when I think about the books I'm reading at the moment throughout this year is I want to read books, I want to read more diversely. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Goodbye! <music>